So good morning. Um, I'm Mike Kasnick with the Maryland Real Estate Commission. Uh, it's really, uh, it, it, coming out and speaking is, is an opportunity that I really look forward to um, for a number of reasons. One, obviously we get to present information uh, from the Commission's perspective and, and some things that uh, may be changing, <coughs> maybe that you weren't aware of, um, but also to have the dialogue. Um, I, I take a few seconds to go back, uh, not this year, but the year before I was at the National Association of Realtors Conference. And uh, I picked a workshop to attend, and I thought it was kind of consistent with or similar to what we did in terms of it was related to uh, their uh, mediation and, and their mediators and what they do. So uh, as with most uh, real estate professionals, when they're in a room, they're talking about deals, and there's this chatter and all this, these things going on. And I was sitting at a round table, and I happened to be introduced towards the end of it. And when I, everybody was talking about which brokerage they were from, so seeing that I'm not with the brokerage, I had to say that I was with the Maryland Real Estate Commission, which I'm proud of, but uh, the minute I said that, the conversation stopped. <laughs> and, uh, we really don't want that to happen here because, um, you know, one, one thing uh, I always do is I carry my book with me, and that's to write down things that, that you have, questions you have, um, uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer all of them, but also ideas, um, things that we could do better, and also things you're seeing in the field that, that are challenging or challenges that you think uh, the Commission should consider or address. So, um, I certainly want that to happen today, um, but I also have some slides to, to go through, and, and these aren't going to be our tether point, but, you know, I'm a visual person, so I like to see slides when somebody's talking to me. Uh, so essentially, let's see, I should have done that first, figured out which one of these. Whoops. Uh-oh. Now I'm definitely going to need some help. <laughs> Okay, so I always uh, start out with a mission statement, and, and really all I want to talk really to this is, this is on our website, uh, but professional, courteous, and reasonable is what we want to project uh, in all our interactions, both with consumers and, and real estate professionals. So uh, if you have an interaction with us that you don't feel went that way, um, my cards are on the table right by the door, along with a copy of the advertising checklist, which I'll talk about later. So if you do have a, some experience that you, know, you weren't happy with, please don't hesitate to call me and we'll, uh, we'll figure out a way to make sure that doesn't happen to you again and also for any other uh, licensees. Okay, so brief outline, and, and again, I, I'm not required to hit on all these, um, so you know, they're just here uh, in case we have questions on it. We have several new investigators. <coughs> Much of my investigation staff has turned over. We have six now, um, all but two of them have less than a year's service, but they're really, really good. We've sent them to workshops and training. They also have backgrounds in investigation, so part of that is not to, uh, not to bring out the bat, but basically to say that, um, you know, anytime there's a complaint and, you know, if you're a subject of it, a lot of times the end result isn't that bad. It's the limbo in between when you're notified of that and when the end result rolls through. So we really are working to clear our cases um, impartially, thoroughly, but also quickly. Um, we also have a paralegal hiring action, which will also help that as well. Currently, we have two paralegals, and we're going to move to three. There are, as of yesterday afternoon, uh, before I, I, when I ran the numbers, there are 45,825 uh, real estate professionals in the state of Maryland. That includes brokers, as well as reciprocals um, from, from Pennsylvania, um, and, and also associate brokers. 800, 1,200 exams a month, depending on what time of year it is, uh, and also the market. But currently, we're, we're on the upper end of that. And the guarantee fund balance is 1,088,893. And I know it's something that we usually, uh, we talk about every commission meeting, also talk about it when I go out and speak, but um, in the uh, recounting by one long, long time real estate licensee, there hasn't been an assessment in, uh, there's been one assessment in the past 30 or so years. So that's something, and, and the fund is, is healthy, so um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. There's also legislation that went through last year um, about transferring that over, transferring operating funds over if it dipped below. So uh, you can be relatively comfortable that that's likely not to happen soon. The commission is composed of five, uh, nine members, five industry and four consumer members. We currently have one consumer opening, um, four-year terms appointed by the governor, and of course protect the public and all those good things. 
regulate and determine the requirements for licensure. So not just time frames, but also um, exams and that sort of thing. That's the current staff. Um, and, and as you can see, it's, it's heavy resource on the investigation side. Only because if you think about it, you know, people talk about I spend, you know, 90% of my time on 1% of my problems. That's kind of the way it works. And uh, that's kind of the way we're resourced uh, to, to make sure that things flow smoothly. On the education side, we have two. And the licensing, we have three folks to handle all the renewals and, and all of that. And I know that many of you um, utilized our, our uh, online site and all that, and that's great. Um, and, and that helps because then if you have a question, we have some folks available to, uh, to work with that as well. All right, laws and regulations. Uh, so the current one um, that went through this past legislative session was on brokerage relationships and disclosure. Uh, so there'll be new, um, new education uh, coming from that. The real estate guarantee fund transfer balance, and that's not until October 1st. And the real estate guarantee fund balance is what I talked about just a few seconds ago. And broker business succession was expanded. Um, this was last cycle, not this cycle, to include um, brokers who were permanently incapacitated. So you have a broker who died. It was it wasn't the law that uh, their family members could take it on for a brief period of time. And without getting into all the legal specifics, if anybody ever falls into that situation, please call the commission to make sure that you're in compliance with it. There are very specific and very um, important steps that need to be taken to do that. Uh, but this just expanded it to be for disability as well. Email notification, this came through a couple of years ago, and I really like to talk about it for a couple of reasons. Um, I won't say it this way, but uh, recently we put out the Commission Checks newsletter. If you received it, uh, your uh, email address with us is likely good. Uh, if you didn't receive it, then maybe I would consider going on and updating that to make sure. Because email notification passed a couple years ago, and we basically send out a hard copy notification uh, talking about, you know, you're coming up for uh, uh, renewal and those sorts of things. And currently, based on this law, we also send an email. So if you think about it, you say, well, I, I got my hard copy. We, the thought process was we'll go through one entire licensing cycle sending out both so that, one, you get it and you're aware of this change. And two, um, it's an opportunity for you to make sure your email address is updated so that you receive the notification next time seamlessly and not late, which could cause uh, issues with renewing and, and other not good things. So um, please uh, go on and, and update your email address if it's not, and um, that way you'll get that electronic notification and things will flow smoothly for you. Because uh, we're, we're nearing sort of the end of that, that period of uh, transition between both forms of communication to just the electronic. Okay, I know I covered this, in, or we covered this in the commission checks, referral status isn't a status. Um, referral agents are fully licensed agents in the state of Maryland, they do all their C, they do, um, they renew, they, they do everything else that every other agent does. It's really the brokerage construct that makes them quote unquote referral agents. I, I don't have referral agents in Maryland law or regulation, so they're fully licensed agents. Inactive status, um, you have to renew to remain inactive, and again, we did talk about this, but they're also responsible for C um, when they go ahead and renew during that period, and they can only be on uh, inactive status for three years, and then they have to go through the entire training again, the class and the test. Continuing education, okay. This is something I, I really do want to impress upon you. Um, continuation is 15 hours. Currently we do a random sampling of um, CE, and that's basically based off um, some of our information systems. Uh, if you, you know, click the box and said you did it and you didn't, that's a bad thing. Um, we are moving to a new system very soon where we will do 100% CE audits. A system will do the map, basically. And when you do get that notice, if you click the box, yes, I did, you get a notice saying you're under a CE audit, you don't have to do anything. Basically, we'll come back to you and say you passed or you didn't. When we say you didn't, that's your opportunity to say, hold on a second, in my record, I'm missing all these things, which many times aren't things that qualify, but um, sometimes they are. The school didn't upload them on time or uh, there was some glitch, so we certainly listen but uh, make sure that your CE is, is good to go uh, before you click the box. Okay. And this is kind of a chart. Um, I know you can't see it from the back. Um, with that new system, we aren't just gonna 100% CE audit everybody. I mean, we will do that, but uh, the other part, part of it is we're gonna try and give you functionality. So before you click on the box, you can look at your record. And some of the things we're going to ask for is, is charts. You know, basically, 
for your licensing status, your uh, team leader, you need to take this. Um, your broker, you need to take this. And then what you have taken, and then that remainder. So like three charts or two charts to make it easy for you to, in good conscience, check that box and, and renew. Or take the classes you need and renew. Uh, OK, advertising. This is kind of the part that um, you had asked about. So uh, we're going to spend some time on advertising. I also heard a lot of teams in here, so that's, that's important too. Um, so advertising in Maryland, under Maryland law and regulation, is pretty much everything you communicate uh, as a licensed real estate professional. So when you send us an email and your signature block in the bottom doesn't include your brokerage, you just violated the advertising law. Um, because I can contact you, but I don't know who your broker is. So make sure that any written, audio, oral, internet, or social media has your broker's information. Broker must be meaningful and conspicuous, not, you know, we, we've seen some doozies, ends of the bell curve kind of things, but, you know, we want to make sure that folks, uh, folks aren't doing that. They want to be, basically the commission's intent, the, the law's intent, is that if I have an issue with you, I can reach out to your broker. Everybody has a boss, I have a boss. If you have an issue with me, I'll give you her name and number. Um, but that's really kind of what Maryland law is, is, set, whoops, is set to address. Um, again, if, you're, if your number's shown, then your broker's number need to, needs to be shown. Uh, if, you're a, if you have a URL, any means to contact you, essentially, is, I guess, the way to boil it down. And uh, that way, if, if somebody does have that issue, they can contact the broker. And, and the good news story is that it helps really all of us. It helps you because if somebody has that problem, they can go to your broker. Your broker can mediate the situation, maybe save the deal. Consumers go to the settlement. They're happy. I'm happy because we don't have a complaint. You're happy because you don't have a complaint. The deal went through. The consumers are happy because their house was sold or they bought the house. So all good stuff. They did hear, the commission did hear that there were issues with um, advertising, concerns, problems. And I will very honestly say that, you know, uh, advertising law and regulation is spread through multiple paragraphs of Maryland law and regulation. So uh, to do that, to kind of address that, they put together an advertising task force of industry professionals and you know, other, other folks to weigh in on this and came up with uh, three recommendations. First recommendation is one click. Does anybody know what one click is? Okay. So if you're licensed in Virginia, they do have the one click role. Essentially, it's a means for you to comply with the law um, of having information to get to your broker on space limited platforms like Twitter. I'm not a Twitter person, but you know, a lot of people in the new generation kind of goes on, on some of these platforms. Now, there is a recommendation and that we're going to propose uh, to go ahead and, and um, get the one-click rule in Maryland. It's not here yet, so don't leave the room and say, one click, and we got it. Um, not yet. You'll hear about it in maybe next update or the one after that. Um, but basically, the commission did hear your concerns. So it would be for 280 characters or less. The best practices checklist, which is the advertising checklist, which is back there. It's also on our website if you need to see it. And that should really guide you with um, preparing your advertisements. Or if some other third party comes to you and says, I do real estate advertisements, just give me your business and you know, we'll, do you, do you know about Maryland law? Because my name's going to be on there, my broker's name's going to be on there. Use this. Make sure it's um, reviewed and approved before it's posted. Because advertising gets to most people, including commissioners and me and all those kinds of folks. So um, you want to make sure you're in compliance. And then the other thing is when there are issues with advertising, uh, we, we used to reach out to the agent. Um, we don't do that anymore. We contact the broker. Then the thought process is really this. If you post an ad that's outside of what's, what's allowed and required, there may be communications issues that might need to be addressed. And this will certainly work that and exercise that um, because your ads under Maryland law need to be reviewed. Um, so if it's missing, uh, if somehow a step was missed, then uh, this can be addressed. And that's the checklist, of course, that's back there. All right, so on Teams. Teams, a lot of times, um, we find have more, we found a greater incidence of teams recently um, not being able to comply with law uh, because they're thinking about branding themselves and 
marketing themselves and, and creating that identity. Um, and sometimes, and there's some, some nuanced things that they need to do as well. So while that's what a team is, uh, two or more people working together on a regular basis, representing themselves to the public, and designating by a connect collective name, um, they also have to, and I'm going to skip it uh, for a little bit here, they also have to be directly connected to the name of the brokerage. So that means not, you know, the Mike Kasnick team of the Maryland Real Estate Commission. It's very specific. It's the Mike Kasnick team of, right in one box, the Maryland Real Estate Commission, of at or with, connecting word, um, all in one group. And we've discussed in commission meetings, there's been discussions about how far apart. It's one group, okay? You're inextricably linked to that brokerage because, you know, when it boils down in law, you can't do real estate transactions without the broker. So you're linked anyway. Show it on your ads. Okay, so for uh, team leaders, three years experience, um, we don't need to get a list of your team members, but we can request it. So you don't have to send us the list, but it has to be available, it has to be current, and of course your broker has to have it. Okay, uh, team leaders shall adhere to all office rules, practices, and procedures. Again, that whole thing where we're a little separate and distinct and different, and that's fine as long as you're kind of under the umbrella and you're directly linked. We're fine with that. Um, and again, the advertising requirements, and this really applies to all, all salespersons, not just teams, but uh, we just wanted to emphasize this on the slide in terms of everything needs to be reviewed and approved because, again, everything's done in the name of the broker. Name of the team. Cannot, offer, cannot reference offering real estate brokerage services independent of the broker. Um, meaningful and conspicuous. And name of at least one team member. No broker number, no agent number. So that's the one time you can get away without putting uh, the agents, no, the, the numbers. You still need the brokerage, but you can get away without the numbers if there's no means to contact you. If I have to take additional steps to find you. Uh, it's not a good idea to do that, and I don't know why you'd want to do that, because <laughs> they, what, you want them to contact you, but, you know, that is a, uh, the way it's written. And uh, directly connected, I think I talked about that. And a phone number is not a requirement if you're in that top box where um, you know, there's no other contact information for you. Dual agency. Um, let me skip that. How many, how many people does it take to have a dual agency relationship in Maryland? Three. On the professional Three. side? Three. Three. <laughs> Three people. You need a broker, you need two agents underneath that brokerage. Um, because we've had instances with that. Um, but again, don't want to talk ends of the bell curve necessarily. Um, so they, the team location needs to be in a office where the licenses are issued and hung. Branch license required if it's a separate office. And of course, the branch matters are required for separate office space, again, with the requirements of the three years. OK, so I have a bunch of slides here. And really, it goes to the fact that um, if you're a team leader, you're really part of that process as well in terms of supervision and broker supervision. And more and more, the commission, when we review complaints, look at, well, okay, this person was part of a team. Who's the team leader? Because they really were part of this process too. So there's multiple levels of, of review and uh, instances where somebody could have stepped in and, and maybe guided the, this, uh, the process of events differently. And uh, those, those are questions that the commission is starting to ask. All right. Um, this really just talks to the burden of proof. And you know, this is kind of more on the negative side of it. But really, if, if you say, I, I do good supervision, and there's no training you gave, no sign-ins you have, no, no documents, no verifiable evidence that you did any of those things, then it's going to be difficult for us to, to, um, to see that from your perspective. Okay. Uh, all right, agency. So agency is still, um, still something that we talk about. And now I will talk into the bell curve here. I had a question come in. They were doing an open house. They said, uh, could we do this form on an iPad and just stick it there? I don't know about you. I'm not going to look on somebody else's iPad. So the answer is no, and actually clearly outlined in law is that it's got to be eight and a half by 11, 
it's got to be exactly the way that's that's uh, presented. Um, I know it's larger there, but um, all those things on the left-hand side. Um, and it's really just communications and expectations, which is where we see, I mean, in sales, it's important, but also um, from the from what we see on the complaint side, it's important. I mean, many people have a different expectation of real estate professionals than, um, than you do. I mean, you're aware that, you know, you aren't going to necessarily go down and check every permit that's ever been pulled open and closed. You're aware that you aren't home inspectors unless you have a home inspection license. Um, so those are types of things that some customers don't know. And communications expectations um, will likely help that, um, if, especially with your uh, first time home buyers, but really anyone who, who's coming to the table and uh, asking for your um, services. Okay. Um, I did go through some agency things here. Um, not sure that uh, this is, I, I mean, I do want to have a lot of time left over for questions and that, so I'm going to skip through some of this. Uh, home improvement. So um, you do know that you have to verify any home improvement professional that you go ahead and, and refer. That's great. I see heads nodding. Um, it's a good thing. The MHIC uh, is it's kind of a sister organization to us. We share the same large office space. You know, the floor on the third floor on Calvert Street, but um, they they have different things that um, their requirements are for home and uh, home improvement licenses as well. And I bring this up really just to say that you know you need to check it. Um, you know you need to inform them of the date you check their license, and um, of, co of course also to provide the MHSC website. But some of the things that I found really interesting were some of the things that fall into what a home improvement is in, in Maryland. And this list does change. Um, on uh, usually an annual <coughs> basis. Uh, but some of the things I, I highlighted in red, I can't see in the back, so I'll read the ones in red only. Uh, built-in closet organizer, somebody who puts those in. Um, home theater systems. Sod and landscaping. Really? Yes, really. <laughs> when they go to home shows, they, they actually have a trifold they give out. Um, but it's also on their website. Caulking, screens, um, chemical power wash. Uh, shutters exterior, uh, wallpaper and coverings. Okay, so then um, this is kind of a busy slide, so it's probably easier to just talk it. Um, okay, so one of the things that, that you probably think, you know, what happens when a complaint comes in? So complaints can be filed online, and they go ahead and they fill out as much information as they can or want, and they submit it, and that opens up a file in our system. So then we're awaiting a hard copy document. So they're told to print off that complaint form and then send it in to us with all appropriate documents that they feel uh, justify, support their case. Um, so then when we receive that, uh, once we receive that entire packet, uh, the information is sent to um, them saying we received it. And then also uh, a, a letter immediately goes out to the broker and whoever the complaint's against. And we're asking for your response. That has to be provided within 30 days. Um, and then. We get that information in. We review that. Um, sometimes it's something that falls completely outside of us. I mean, um, if it's, I mean, we get, obviously since it's an online complaint system, we get everything. Sometimes it's uh, a complaint against a home inspector. Uh, so obviously we don't have jurisdiction there. Uh, so we'll refer them over to that. But that's the first step to where things can be dismissed. Actually, the very first step is they never follow up. Um, if they don't uh, follow up within 30 days and you know, 60 days go by and they call us and we say, hey, can you reopen that complaint? Absolutely we can. So that doesn't necessarily get everybody off the hook, but um, it is a, a get off where we stop the complaint if um, we don't receive that. Then there's the, re the responses that we receive and we, we review them. And at that point, it's not in our jurisdiction, it goes away uh, if it's, or it's referred to another um, entity. Then uh, the other part is if it's uh, really not substantiated, there's not enough documents there, and that will go to the commission and they'll vote to dismiss uh, if, if, that's, if they feel the same way. And then finally, it's the, the last part that is more, um, you know, there's enough there and we really think there is something there, so then that will go to investigation. At that point, um, there'll be a lag and you might, might not hear anything. And then uh, once the investigator gets it, they'll contact you to sit down with you and your broker and anybody else. Um, and then sometimes it 
gets to be more and more as they talk with different individuals. And uh, then they'll prepare a report. Their reports are very factual. It's not, I really think this person did wrong. It's, I asked them this question, this was their answer. And then the commission reviews all of that documentation and then ultimately decides on the disposition of the case. And at that point, um, they either they come up with a recommended uh, decision and then it would perhaps go to the Office of Administrative Hearings. And there's two kinds of complaints. There's a guarantee fund where people are looking for money. They were wronged and there's evidence that they're submitting for um, an actual loss. And then the other one is a regulatory charge. And that's, um, you know, perhaps your license is going to be suspended for a little bit or something like that. So that's kind of the two parts of the complaint process. Uh, the other things are related to complaints. What, what do we get a lot of our complaints related to? Uh, agents purchasing and rehabbing properties and then not doing their property disclosures. Not using licensed contractors for that. Because if you have to refer people to licensed contractors, if you own the home, you have to utilize licensed contractors. Not opening or closing permits. And of course, not disclosing material facts or latent defects. All things that will uh, that we're seeing a lot of in the complaint department. Yes? I have a morbid curiosity. So you said like there's 45,000 in the state of Maryland mm -hmm. agents. How, what's the percentage of agents that have complaints filed against them? I'm glad you asked that question because normally I do say that. And that's what, that's what kind of makes me okay with this. 1.6. 1.6. 1.6. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Pretty small. Well, it's, I mean, you know, yes, it's, it's small in comparison to the larger field. Of course, on our end, we see roughly 800 complaints a, a year, so, you okay. know, it seems large to us, but uh, yes, to put it in perspective, and I'm glad you asked the question, uh, it's, it's about 1.6%. Okay, property management, we also get complaints related to that. I have a question. What's, yeah, what's please. the most common complaint besides my agent doesn't get back to me or something that I'm shouting <laughs> to about? What's, what's the real complaint you guys are seeing more so today and, you know, whatever? Well, I mean, a lot of it is related to the, the, the rehabs uh, of properties. Rehabs? Yeah. Um, you know, an agent who's involved with it. What, what do you mean? So, it, I mean, if you're purchasing a reha rehabilitating property, it's your property. You purchased it, you rehabbed it. So buyers are mad that an agent rehabbed the property? No, not at all. They didn't do it properly. They, they were aware of a wet basement. They were aware of certain things that they should have disclosed. Because most of those, I mean, when the complaints come in at least, I mean, I'm not saying most of the agents who do it do this, but most of the, the complaints that come in, they've disclaimed. And, you know, that's perfectly within your right as an agent to disclaim if you own the property. Maybe you didn't live there. But, for instance, um, there's one case I can remember. The agent, it was a big rehab, and they, were, they owned the property for a significant period of time, like more than a year. And uh, over that year, weather was relatively dry. Um, they sold the house. Uh, excuse me, weather was relatively wet. They sold the house. And briefly, very briefly thereafter, the basement is completely flooded. They, they maintained in their response that they were at the property almost every day each, during that year. You know, there's a lot of things, and there was more to the file, of course, than just that. But in those types of cases, I mean, you, you can sign the disclaimer, but you still have to talk about, you know, the wet basement that you're aware of. Yes? Um, I hope people don't throw things at me when I say <laughs> this. I'm a relatively new agent, okay. and I noticed that the licensure hurdle is is relatively low to become a real estate agent. And it, it's just interesting to me why we're not required to pass <coughs> background checks, drug testing, or anything like that when we're given the keys to people's homes. Well, um, you do check on, on your box when you apply. Uh, if you have any convictions and any felonies or misdemeanors that you need to make us aware of, and then uh, we'll ask you for those documents, and then we'll consider your application as part of that. So, I mean, even if you do have something in your background, because, I mean, there are cases, you know, 40 years ago somebody did something, um, and, and they present that. And they say, you know, yes, I did. They check the box. We, did, we basically, um, you know, uh, want to hear from them what they've done, what their records have been. So they'll go before panel commissioners in those cases. But I mean, there are there are things in there that um, you 
do need to present that you are a good character. I know I didn't answer your question by the look on your face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just seems like we're, we're our, the barrier to entry in this field is so low. Mm -hmm. And that's part of why there are so many. And I hear things about, I hear things from my clients about experiences they've had with other licensed agents. Like, like last week, this man said to me, I think the guy that showed us the rental in Gaithersburg was on some kind of drugs. You know, the guy was on something. And, and I'm just like, oh, you know, I mean, I hear things that probably nobody ever makes a complaint, but, you know, the barrier to entry is so low in our field. Well, I mean, for the, the, for the legal types of things, it, you're, you're affirming that you don't have things in your background. And certainly if somebody had um, a conviction for DUI or something like that, would be something they would need to, to disclose to us. Um, now on the professional side, of course, the, the 60 hours plus the exams, both the national and the state, are kind of geared towards making sure that you know how to do the regulatory piece of it. Um, but I, I mean, I will say that you know, in terms of you know the sales packets and all those kinds of things, we don't oversee that. I mean, there are certain disclosure forms that need to be included as part of all that. But when people start talking about contracts and that sort of thing. Um, that's something that, you know, as you know, are done by either your associations or those sorts of things. So we'll look through a complaint to see what things are said in there and outlined and documented. But really the, the regulatory piece from your class and passing the test are what would give you the um, legal ability to do real estate broker services underneath the broker. The only issue with that, though, is the on it. Okay, I'll come back to you. <laughs> yes? Just to pile on behind that. Uh, the National Association of Realtors put out a white paper back in 2011, 2012, sometime in that time frame. It spoke to agent professionalism and the lack of training, blah, blah, blah. As one of their uh, highest priority issues, one of the biggest areas of risk for our industry. And they've done all sorts of studies up into including, I think Texas has the most stringent requirements, the most licensing hours to become a real estate agent, and there's no correlation between the length of time required to get uh, a license versus the end result professionalism that comes out of you. So they're still trying to figure that out. Hmm. I was just going to say, name the professions that have a fiduciary relationship to their clients. We are by far the least educated out of all those necessary professions. <laughs> so easy an army infantryman can do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th there are, uh, again, we, we see a wide variety of instances where, where that broke down. Um, and, and fortunately, it ends up being you know, less than that 2%. But yeah, I mean, I, I've been in similar circumstances as this and, and you know, advocated, and, and I'll do this here too, uh, to make sure that uh, your people who you're representing know what they're signing. Um, I had one person in the back of the room say, well, I don't want to do that because I can't answer legal questions, which is true. I can't be an attorney um, without a license. However, um, their, their, their 